Welcome to the Mentors by Design podcast. In this show, Fine Design CEO Victor Kostrup brings ideas and inspiration through thought-provoking conversations with entrepreneurs and experts. Whether you're just getting started on your journey or are a seasoned business owner, this show is designed to give you insight into what it takes to succeed. Here's your host, Victor Kostrup. Hello and welcome, uh, Mentors by Design. I am Victor Kostrup. Some of the commonly eaten foods in the restaurant, as we know, it's salads, burgers, fries, fish, and steaks. And then if you like it and you have a chance to visit fine dining, then you're going to see things like caviar, crab cakes, foie gras, oysters, and maybe even you will see Wagyu steaks. And there is a variety of them, American, Australian, Japanese. In Japanese, they list price by ounces because they don't want to kill you with, with the price because otherwise it will be like $500 for a steak. So they put the ounces. So you might think this is the, the price of the steak, but it's only one ounce, usually at least like $50. That's what I have seen. And that, so that's been most expensive thing on the menu besides the caviar, but who eats the caviar? I want a steak. And, and if I'm on a vacation, definitely I wanted the best steak. And usually you go for the, the most expensive thing because that's obviously the best quality, but not 500, right? So I always want to ask the question, why is it cost so much? Why? And finally, we have a special guest today. We have Henry, we have Greg, who is the founder and the founder of Whole Farmstead. And Henry will join us as well. So Greg, may I ask you, and Henry, you might add anytime you wish, what is so special about those Wagyu steaks? Well, I think a lot of it is the genetics of the cattle. Uh, the cattle are Japanese, originated in Japan, and have been here in the United States for about 25 years, 25, 30 years. And, you know, the breed is growing in the United States. However, you know, we have the genetics, but uh, I think what takes uh, us from the others is that the proprietary blend of grain that we're using to finish our cattle which gives a lot more marbling and a lot better flavor to the, to the beef. But uh, the cattle have been here for around 30 years out of, from Japan and, and are being raised in multiple places across the United States. I see. So how is it listed when your Wagyu steaks? Is it says American or is it says Japanese? Ours is a purebred Wagyu beef. American generally is a, a cross between a Wagyu, between Wagyu cattle and American cattle or Angus, uh, Charley, those kind of red Angus, Herefords, they mix. Or So there's generally it's around 50. When you buy a steak in the restaurants, generally it's 50-50, a Wagyu, an American breed cattle. So can you tell us a little bit more about your business? What, what do you guys do? Is this as a wholesale or this is more like a restaurant? What do you guys do? We, uh, we raise the cattle on the farm in Kentucky. We have our own land that we raise our grains on. We Our cattle are pasture raised up until a little over a year old. And then we put them in. Then at that point, we start putting them in the, in the finishing process, which is a six-stage process. And then after about 26 months of age, then we would start the processing of the cattle for the, the beef. And we sell online you can go to hallfarmstead.com and order from our e-commerce platform and we sell to restaurants and butcher shops i see so how much of the business that is e-commerce like orders online versus to sell to to restaurants would you say it's it's about 50 50. oh that's pretty good that's yeah. pretty good so as you just said that i'm i'm sure my son as soon as i'm finished he's going to order some of the wagyu steaks from you guys i'm excited isn't it true what i heard that the difference how you care for this breed cattle breed is you feed them with beer 
and then do massages is that's what I mean. <laughs> well that that's that's what is you know that's the I guess the story that comes out of Japan but at Hall Farmstead we're not feeding beer or massaging the cattle but we are taking care of the cattle at a very high level and one of the things that's important to us and has been important since the start has been the quality of our beef. So we focus totally on quality over anything for the and we've been raising the cattle for nine years and we just focused on on quality and making sure that the cattle are raised humanely and 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 and, and a very uh you know above average or great environment so that you know they're all you know they're not out raised in a way that they're mistreated or anything. So we really take huge pride in that. And we believe that that is very important in the end result as well. But the cattle, we, with the grain that we have and working with nutritionists, both in the United States and Japan to better understand how we can utilize the grains that we have, that we, that are raised in the area of Kentucky where we're at to ensure that we're getting the nutritional value to the cattle to to and make sure that we have you know high marbling scores which is key right and as well as the tenderness and taste of our beef and we feel that we can our beef can be you know tested with and compared to any beef out there anywhere in the vacation of wagyu and you know it's going to exceed expectations so what does it mean, Wagyu? What does it mean, Wagyu? Wagyu, Henry, do you want to jump in here? Yeah, so Wagyu is basically, Gyu is meat, right? Beef. And Wa is American for, you know, purebred beef. So Wagyu cattle itself, so when you when you hear about that, there's two different types. There's Wagyu called the Kuro Ushi, which is the black cow. And then there's the Aka Ushi. And the Aka Ushi is a leaner meat. And the flavor profile is a little bit different, a little bit more on the tastier side. While you may be used, Julian, to kuro ushi, which is the black cow, and that's known for their marbling. So the really heavy fat content that you see, you hear about a restaurant that has Miyazaki A5 grade, right? Because it's the marbling side. Now, what you know, Greg was talking about earlier is as it's very difficult to get purebred jack these cattle in the U.S. because it takes many generations of, you know, cycles for the right. get to the point. It's not just, you know, having a, a bull that's a Wagyu, you know, and a heifer that is American, uh, like to say Holstein or Angus, because that's anyone can do that, to be blunt with you. But what Greg's done, it takes very many years and it's, it's something that's very special and that he's, you know, got the largest herd in the uh, eastern part of the U.S. I see. Well, you guys don't see the video as I see, but Henry, he is Japanese. And like in private conversation, I, I have mentioned that I have visited Japan myself for a couple of times. And I'm just have to say, I have so much respect for people and the culture and just anything made in Japan, it, you already have the so much trust for the quality but speaking of this idea greg how did you come up with this idea like wagyu and then especially the quality that you were going after which henry just explained in details that's much different than for example just regular american wagyu to achieve that result but to achieve this marbling like you you get with japanese that's like um if wh whoever in this business understand it's a very very high standards how did you come up with that idea well uh, first of all i had been acquiring land in kentucky where i was born and raised and then i had moved away and, and my career had taken me around the world as far as travel with business and then i'd eaten or had been to many high-end restaurants and had had the Wagyu and really loved the flavor profile and the tenderness of the beef. And as I was acquiring land there, you know, I was looking for some way to differentiate the farm from others. And then knowing that the area where I'm from is has great natural resources for raising cattle and that there were 
you know, very many farms in the area that raised cattle and, and then and cow calf operations and sold their, their calves to the feedlots in the Midwest and West. I thought it would make a lot of sense to have a higher quality beef in the area and not ship the beef off to the West and try to develop a market in the Kentucky, Tennessee area for the cattle. At the same time, my brother, who actually is the one running the farm on a day-to-day -day basis, my brother, where he was employed, the factory that he was employed in was being shut down. And uh, in, so th when that happened, I had the opportunity to have someone who I trusted immensely to help me with the, the farm. And we started it up and I had been doing some research and a, another partner of mine, Nick Patterson, had also a farmer in the area, had, had been researching the Akushi cattle. And so we, we looked at it and decided that we would buy the cattle um, and give it a shot and see how they worked out. So after one year of having the cattle on the farm and how well they did, then we uh, increased our head count. And then we've been raising the cattle from within since. And we've had you know great success, not only with the beef, but also with the the cattle adapting to the atmosphere or the, or the environment of Kentucky, you know, with our rolling hills and, and our weather. So in other words, the cattle is fortunate to, to be raised in Kentucky, I guess, because, yes. because of the, of the land, maybe it's has some similarity what they have in that region of, of Japan when they raise the cattle, because I heard that being in Japan, that there is, it's not like all over Japan that they raise the cattle, but it's like a spe specific region in Japan. And that's why they come up with that other name i forgot maybe you can help me henry or greg with that name that they raise specifically there and uh, so that's plays a huge role so that's why i understand you're fortunate that you were born and raised in kentucky and then you could actually fulfill your dream to have such a great quality stakes. Speaking of the farm industry how much the farm industry changed in the last decade I think it's changed a lot, you know, many years ago or not, you know, say 20 years ago, a lot of farmers, you know, were raising cattle and grain on smaller plots of land and, and there's just been a consolidation there. And it's hard for a farmer or a, I guess a, someone who's working a regular job and then farming on the side to really make any money in the farming industry anymore. It's, it's really consolidated and you need larger farms to compete. One of the things that happened in the area where I'm from in Kentucky is that there were a lot of tobacco farmers. I see. And so with, you know, the changes there and the, there's the government subsidies and things around tobacco farming all went away. So it really impacted the area and, and there's a need for the area to have a new income source from farming. And that's hopefully what we're trying to do long-term is to get more farmers involved in raising the uh, Wagner beef and, and to improve the genetics of the area as far as uh, the cattle goes so that the farm, local farmers can receive a premium for their cattle. Wow, I'm surprised you're saying that. Are you not afraid of the competition if you build the culture about the raising the Wagyu? I, other I, people I, pick up on that? Well, I mean, that can happen. And I think, well, you know, what's more important to me is that we were, you know, creating a region in the United States where the quality of the cattle is, is known. And I think everybody wins there. And at the same time, it, it, it's important for us is as our business grows, if we have other sources of the cattle that we can finish out that are raised there from our own bloodlines, it, it's a, it's good for us. So it's a, it's somewhat of a selfish reason, but not entirely because I truly feel that the region is conducive to great natural resources for the cattle and thus with the genetics that we are in, have, have brought to the area and can infiltrate more of the other farms and then they start raising more of this beef, it only helps everyone.
Wow, I really, really admire that. You're the man of the big heart. If obviously you've been in business for many, many years, and now you're not selfishly focused just on your own profit, but you see the bigger, bigger picture. That's really, really something. Global shortage, how that affect you guys for the last year with, with the war taking place in Ukraine? Oh, I mean, what it, I, well, of course, all our, you know, fuel costs to run the farm have, have, have went up. Our, you know, we raise our grains, so the, the corn and the soybean prices and such haven't impacted us that much because we, you know, we're raising our own grains on the farm. But we have, you know, seen that just it, all, everything from tires to your diesel, your gas, fencing, all your input costs. So did you have to increase the price for your products as well? No, we have not. We've oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's rare because like, that's the excuse that I'm hearing. Everybody is trying to, to increase the price to justify the which global shortage or uh, other reasons for that. I'd like to go back and uh, obviously you built a successful business. And as you know, my podcast, it's about mentorship. It's mentors by design. Uh, the question would be who helped you on the way, like Mark uh, Randolph, the founder and the CEO of Netflix, recently tweeted, most young entrepreneurs, they don't need advice, but they need a mentor. What do you think about that? And have you found a mentorship valuable in your career? Oh, yes, definitely. I mean, I mentioned many people over the years that were there, you know, that helped me tremendously as I was growing a business, not farming related, but in the packaging world. And uh, there were just, you know, multiple people along the way that, and some that, you know, I'm, that were there every step of the way, helping, you know, and, and giving advice and as well as in the farming side. I mean, I came into this not really knowing it. I had an idea. I had a vision of where I, what I thought could happen. And, you know, luckily for me, the found some people that, you know, thought the same could happen, but had more knowledge of farming than I did. And one being Nick Patterson and, and Dr. Aaron Cooper, who is, you know, a leading person in the Akushi cattle world that have, have really, you know, worked with me to help develop the program that we have now, the nutritional program, as, as well as how we raise the cattle, how, you know, the, the freedom we give the cattle for on the range or on the pasture land before we start the process in this, in the whole welfare of how we take care of the cattle, because all of those things are as important as anything in making sure that you have the highest quality beef, because if the cattle are not stressed in any way, they're going to produce a more marbled, tender, tasteful beef. And having those, you know, people that experts in the field to, you know, work with you closely developing the program, it was, has been, you know, a very major, valuable. Yeah, very, very valuable. valuable yes. Very valuable. Going back, I'm always trying to put myself in the shoes of the, of the young entrepreneurs who dream to have business, who, who have the idea, but they are afraid to move forward because there is a lot of uncertainty. There is a statistic shows that every 95% of the new businesses, they, they're fail. So I want to ask you a question and think about this young people, like if what they can relate to you, what challenges did you have to overcome at the beginning of your journey? Well, I mean, as you know, with all new businesses, you got to have the, you got to stomach the investment that you're putting in right? and the, the need to invest in the business to get it up to a point where it starts cash flowing itself. Were so, you like uh, financially comfortable to go with this plan or were you like trying to survive at that, at that time during that time? Was it like really putting everything online, like a hundred percent and everything in risking everything, whether this is going to work or if you fail, you fail completely. Well, no, not really. I mean, not from that aspect, but I will say this, I, you know, I knew that it was going to take several years 
and lots of investment to get up to where we need to be. And more importantly, I did not want to go live selling our beef in the marketplace until we had reached the level of quality that I thought put us at world class. And we worked very hard at that. And there was a lot of, a lot of expense in doing whatever necessary to continually improve our beef appearance, taste, overall quality. And we continue to work on that. And, you know, I will say this, every time we process the beef, you know, we all come together and look at the beef and, and to uh, understand, you know, looking at it, how it compares to the last. And we, you know, our goal is to continually improve in each and every time. So what I would say to anyone that's going to be in any business or whatever, you right. know, first of all, you got to have a passion for what you're doing. Yes. If you don't have passion for what you're doing, you should do something else. And then that's <laughs> nothing wrong at all. And then right. in my pre previous life, that's what I would tell young, you know, managers in the business is look, you know, first and foremost, you got to have a passion for this business. And if you have a passion for it, then great things happen. If you don't, you know, you need to find your passion. So I would say that's number one. Number two is that you've got to be continually looking to improve all aspects of your business. And whether that's quality or cost or whatever, you've always got to be doing, doing that. And if you're doing that and you're looking at everything and you're trying to improve, you can never say that you have done all you can do because there's always more can be done. You can always improve and you got to get up each morning and saying that, you know, today I got to do better than yesterday and improve my operation. So I think that's critical for any young person coming into any business, whether it's, you know, farming or any type of business that's out there. And then lastly is that nothing's given to you. You got to earn it and that's you got to right. get out there. So, that's and then also, be, as you said, find someone that knows the business and, you know, connect with them and get good mentoring from them, which can help, but also you mentor back when it's all said and done and you've been successful, you need to mentor back. Yeah. I really appreciate for that. And correct me if I'm wrong, but besides what you just listed, like a passion, burning desire, what I think in your case, why you were successful in your successful and still are, and you're always obsessed with the quality, forgive me for using the word obsessed. Maybe that sounds negative, but in my meaning, I see it's, it's like positive because the only person who is like obsessed with the quality will reach to that, always will improve the, the quality. But I think what would also help you is that you have served the open niche that nobody was even competing in that level. And you served that open niche and uh, you went for it. When we first were starting, there was, you know, the American Wagyu, which is, it's a level F1 or 50-50, you know, 50% Wagyu cattle, which is, you know, predominantly what is raised in the United States. One of the thoughts I had there was, look, everybody's getting into that. If I stay at the F1 stage, 50-50, all I'm going to be doing is competing and I'm getting, you know, 30 cents, which is not bad, but I'm getting, say, 30 cents a pound higher uh, price than just a regular cow. But if I can continue to improve my genetics and the percentage of cattle that I have, which now we have all purebred Wagyu cattle, then I, you know, I differentiate myself from everyone else. And I have a market and a marketing product that, you know, it's going to be difficult for everyone else to number one, to reach that. But secondly, is that the, our quality is going to be so much higher than, than the other American Wagyu, which would open doors for us and, and, and allow us to have a premium in pricing in comparison to American Wagyu. I see. And that's why you are so confident about competition because of the, the quality that you have. So that's great. Henry, do you have anything to add? I know you played a big role in the business as well. Yeah, if I could add, if I could add one thing, Henry's been, you know, a huge help for me on the marketing side, as well as the, the business as a whole, 
And over the last year and a half, he's been involved on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, he's a, he's a great partner in the business because he, you know, and he's helping, you, you speak about mentoring, he's helping mentor the people who work at the farm as well. So it's, it's been a, a, a great collaboration between Henry and I. Well, I love the word collaboration and a teamwork. Henry, if I can ask you more specifically, since you are the man for the marketing, what was the numbers before you came on a board and the to now? And what advice, like for the marketing standpoint, would you give to new entrepreneurs or the existing one? Well, thanks, Julian. On that one there, it's really, you know, building the business itself was really what we were trying to get towards. So going to market was one of the first things we had to work with. And we're still in that process, right? Because we did a pressure test with friends and family at first. And that was one of the first things I would always recommend to someone is to make sure that the, the concept can be made into reality. So just like when you want to brand, even at the biggest corporations, you don't go national, you want to do regional oh. tests to make sure it works. And I agree, that's work, such a good advice. Right. Then you then you go to the national perspective of that. And that's one of the things where we made sure that it worked on the local scales. And now we're you know able to go to the national side of things. We partnered with Hero Brands most recently for the big game this weekend with their bread. At the same time, you know, we talked about, you know, the the passion that Greg has and being able to work together and the collaboration. And that's all about getting the right people together, right? Why was Greg so successful in his career? Yeah, in the corporate world is because he found the right people to work with. And that's absolutely critical when you talk about mentoring, right? right. Uh, young generation themselves, they've got, they're the future. And if we don't give them the tools necessary and the guidance necessary, then, then we're all in trouble because we rely on them to support us as we get older and we're getting to that point. At the same time, you know, we've got things in our brains that I think we have a, an advantage of them at times because we have those relationships, we have those networks, and it's up to us to share that because when we die, it doesn't do us any good to have all that knowledge in our brains if we didn't share it with someone else. That's great. I like that that spirit. Maybe that comes from Kentucky. And speaking <laughs> of Kentucky, I know it's more conservative state and I have my own office there as well because we're the nationwide company, fine designs. I mean, we're a global company because we, have, we also sell in Australia, New Zealand, Europe. We're the company that sell event merchandise right on site at the event events. And we do about 150 events per weekend. And just like Henry just said, the wisdom was is to build the local reputation. And as you build the local reputation and people just go like, wow, I love your product. Then you go to regional and then after regional, you go to national. And as we build the national reputation with that, well, it's like, how about we test the ground in Europe and so on. Greg, I want to ask you a question. You've been in business obviously for a long time. You have a lot of experience. If you received a resume from a potential employee, what are the things are you looking for? Talent? versus integrity, what the things are you looking for? How would you, based on what you would hire the person? Well, I, I think, you know, one thing I like to look at immediately, and, and again, this is not, if, if it's someone coming out of school, so I'll put it in different levels. If it's someone coming out of school, I mean, I like to look at, you know, what were the activities that they were involved in when they were in school? I mean, did, yeah, it, because to me, if they got activities that they're involved in, uh, then they're, they're more of a well-rounded person. They, you know, had different experiences, which is key to being successful, as you know. And then just looking at, you know, of course, you're looking at, you know, where they went to school and those kind of things, uh, education background. Would but you check their me, references? Yeah, yes, definitely. You know, not, you know, just one or two or whatever, just to make sure that everything is as it should be. But you got to trust people too, right? So, right, you know, right. If you start getting too deep there, I think you probably shouldn't be looking for the person because they obviously there was something there that, that you know, that gave you some discomfort. But uh, the, you know, looking at the, 
you know, when they went to school is important, but you know, the activities I think for me are more important because it tells me that I got a well-rounded person. And when you say activities and they're just coming from the school, you're talking about like being a volunteer, a different project. Exactly. Volunteering, sports, or different things when they were missionary in, or just, or, just you know, in even, general, even in high school, you know, things that they've done there that for just to, as they progressed in, in life, were they doing activities other than just school because i think that's is important as school in my opinion and then the sec the second thing i would tell you is if i'm looking for people who have actually been, that are out there have been in the workforce for a while and and are looking and you, you're looking at the resume one of the things i look at on a resume is and i know this is something that with the you know the, the latest generation of workers or people looking for jobs or teammates is that uh, this you know, has been an issue, but I, I like to look at longevity at wherever they were at previously. Right. Uh, if I'm looking at something in great resume, but they move somewhere every year, then that's not really something yeah. that's good for. Uh, so that's like for, a red, for, red flag. For, I like to do long-term relationships and I'm a, I'm a long-term thinker and long-term relationships are important and partnerships are important. And I look at the same with the team members that are working with me at, at the business that they, you know, I want them to be you know, bought in and long-term thinking as well. So the, that would be the two things that I, you know, from one being, you know, team members coming out of, out of the college and then the other being team members that have been in the workforce for some time and that you're, you're recruiting to come onto your team. No, I completely understand. And I can say that it's so relevant to, to any businesses because like you take a person you then you start mentoring that person and you invest a lot of your time and if you're not looking for the long term you're not doing any favors to yourself so obviously you do have to look for the long term you invest you mentoring and what kind of what a discouraging to see that uh, it doesn't meet your expectation at all and the only person you have to blame is yourself because there were many signs that you could have seen that from the beginning, there was lack of references. And then, like you said, there was signs that moving from one place to another place every month. So, and you didn't pay attention to that and went alone because you thought this person is very talented. But to me is if I have to choose between talent versus integrity, I choose always integrity because that person is uh, that person could actually be teachable. He was, would be learning something and you could actually lead that person and inspire that person than the person who's lacking the integrity. One more question before we going to end this program is what advice would you give to someone who hates their job and they have the idea to start their own, but the fear of unknown simply kills them. Well, I mean, first and foremost there, you know, I, I believe if you don't like what you're doing and you don't have passion for it, you should do something else. So, I mean, as I said earlier, I've had this conversation with many team members over the years and, you know, I encourage them to do something else if they don't have a passion for what they're doing. But to answer your question is that when you go into something, you got to have passion for it, but you've got to be able to take calculated risk. And so you cannot start up a new business and think that it, day one, everything's going to go perfectly and you're, you're going to be able to leave your job and start this new venture up and you're going to be at the, you know, same salary level or cash flow of the business. All of those things are going to be positive day one because they're not, and you got to have a plan or that you can survive for a period of time to get the business up and running. And generally that, you know, is a year at least. So, you know, they so got to have the right expectation that. as well. They got to have the right mindset. Oh, that that's a good one. They, right mindset. Right. Day one's not going to be, you got to work hard and you want, if you set a goal of being profitable in that business from the startup and you will be very disappointed your, that yeah, yeah exactly but exceeding you're not going to see the rewards level, you got to get up each morning and work hard to beat that goal that you've set so that you can reduce that period of time where you know you're not performing at, at 
the level you left to go start the venture. So there's a lot of, you know, what I would tell you is you got to focus on your business plan, make sure you've got a strong business plan for what you want to do. And then a lot of people, you know, are passionate about things that they want to go do it. And they, they're not concerned about meeting their expectations, uh, 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 salary <laughs> expectations from the past, as long as they're, they're happy in what they're doing. And I encourage that as well. I mean, you know, right. life's too short to go through life, you know, not enjoying what you're doing each and every day. Yeah. I remember the the first time we were using the idea of franchise in our industry, in our business. And uh, there was a very talented young man from Dallas, Texas, and he was passionate about this idea to be a part of our team and lead the office in Texas in that whole region. But then two months later, he just all stressed out. He's calling me and he said, you know, I calculated how much time I spent. And if I would, would be working in McDonald's, I would be making more money than I'm making now. And I was trying to open his eyes to the bigger pictures, to the long term. You look in the short term reward. You have to look at the long term you invest in and there will be time coming where you will be getting much more and but you have to trust you have to go with that idea and build the trust locally and then regionally and and it takes time but anyway <laughs> he was blind to see he was blind to see so i had to replace with another person who took that job willingly two years later they both meet and he said looking at the other person's success and what kind of business he was able to build. He said, I wish I realized, Victor, what you were talking about. I just was so blind to see. And now he said, I would be willing even to go and my expectation for the salary would be absolutely almost like at zero, as long as I pay some of my bills, if I could have this, because it gives the meaning to somebody's life. Because if you have that if you work and you up each morning you go to work and you have desire you have passion it's like you're calling and you feel you answer the question man that's a meaning to my life i love this and you carry this energy to your home to your loved ones and that's how the life it should be anyway our time is all over and i have to run this up so, so many of us have a habit of blaming our circumstances, the economy, the world, or others when things go wrong, but that's counterproductive. So what can you do instead? And as we talk today with Greg and Henry, if you guys were listening and paying attention, what they were saying is taking complete ownership of your life. So therefore, don't rob yourself of new opportunities that you actually have that burning desire. You have that passion. Have you ever taken a risk and made a change when your confidence was low? Probably not, right? So if you want to be at your best self, you have to feel your best, which means you have to have a passion and therefore confidence. And Believe me, it's absolutely possible. If we listen to this story and many others, Greg had the dream of the Japanese quality Wagyu. And look, it's possible in Kentucky. And now it's building to much bigger business. So it's absolutely possible. That's the fact. But it's not going to happen on its own. That's also a fact. So start looking inward. Start finding new ways to be your best self and at rest will fall into place. You'll see it. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Gregory. Thank you, Henry, for your time. And God bless you in your business. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Mentors by Design podcast. This show is sponsored by Fine Designs. Learn more about how Fine Designs can supply apparel for your events at finedesigns.com.